Coming up next on Passion Struck. What we found in our research was that we are sorted out into two different brain types. We each fit into one of these brain types. They're based on a deficiency in one of two neurotransmitters that we inherit. So we don't actually have a choice about which team we're on. And one of the transmitters is dopamine, which is a more activating neurotransmitter. And the other transmitter is serotonin, which is a more calming neurotransmitter. And to go a little deeper, these two interfacing transmitter types are necessary for evolution in order for the species to evolve, and not just in humans, but in all animals. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles, and on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Connell Howen and Dr. David Kipper to Passion Struck. We will be talking today about this book that I have right here, Override, and I'm so excited to have you on and congratulations on the launch of your book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think it's important for the audience to get to know both of you and i always wonder when people collaborate on a book what made that happen so i was hoping you guys could go through this 50-year relationship that you've had and the epiphany that led you to writing this book we met a long time ago we became friends we started working together we've had a very long rich friendship and collaboration for many years And I think one of the things that professionally that struck us was from my point of view as a psychologist and from David's point of view as an internist, how hard it is for people to use the kind of information that they get about themselves, about life, about what would be healthy and constructive for them to be able to incorporate easily. They just were not able to do that. There was a resistance to changing those things that would have made their lives better. And I think it was really that kind of question that led us into exploring what that resistance to change is. And it led us to how we manage stress and how it's influenced by our brain chemistry and the autonomic nervous system that we all have and the slight imbalances that I think tip us toward habitual behaviors that make us very resistant to change. And what we've learned how to do and what we've incorporated into the book is ways to leverage those brain chemistry tendencies that we have in a way that not only addresses resistance to change, but actually makes it a little bit easier to overcome. That's really why we titled the book Override. Okay, and David, I think to lay a baseline down, throughout the book, you refer to shields and swords as the two different types of brain types. And this is what sets the baseline for the entire book. Can you go through for the audience, what is the difference between the two and how might someone recognize what they are? So John, just to add a little bit to what Connell said, one of the things that we realized was that the generic advice that we were both giving as a medical doctor and as a psychologist, were not holding water and all these self-help books weren't seeming to give the answers. So we knew there was something deeper and what we found in our research was that we are sorted out into two different brain types. We each fit into one of these brain types. 
there are hybrids to these brain types. But they're based on a deficiency in one of two neurotransmitters that we inherit. So we don't actually have a choice about which team we're on. And one of the transmitters is dopamine, which is a more activating neurotransmitter. And the other transmitter is serotonin, which is a more calming neurotransmitter. And to go a little deeper, these two interfacing transmitter types are necessary for evolution in order for the species to evolve. And not just in humans, but in all animals. It was interesting in our research that we found this to be true in birds and in, in mice and in, in other animals that were non-human. So the two different types sort out, as I said, into one that is more exploratory, risk-taking, issues with managing their impulse, needing immediate gratification, motivated by reward. And these were the dopamine deficient group. This was a group that was more associated with the type A personality, the more optimistic personality, but this is where it came from. It came from this relative deficiency in the neurotransmitter dopamine. On the other side of the equation are those that are deficient in the neurotransmitter serotonin. And again, opposite to their dopamine cousins, these are people that are more cautious, are less likely to take a risk, control their impulses better. They are worry warts. They can be hypochondriacal. So these two groups were bipolar opposites in their behavioral patterns. And these behaviors were predictable. There are no specific or meaningful tests in the blood for serotonin and dopamine. We can certainly test for these, but they're evanescent in the bloodstream. So depending on what you're doing at the time, how stressed you are, how relaxed you are, those values don't really give us much information. Connell and I looked at the behavioral patterns that separated out, as I just described. So the people that are more outgoing and more curious and risk tolerant, we call those people the swords, again, just to give it a name. And the people that were more cautious and protective, we called shields. So the swords are those that are dopamine imbalanced and the shields are those that are serotonin imbalanced. And we use this nomenclature in order to facilitate your reading through the book and applying this to the different chapters that you mentioned and parts of our lives that are all affected by these differences. And I think a follow-on question to that would be, how does each type cope with stress? Because I imagine it's very different depending on what type of brain balance that you have. It is, and it, it really relates to these imbalances are really in the direction of being slight deficiencies in those neurotransmitters. So that the people who are imbalanced in the serotonin side, on the calming side, it, they have experienced too much activation, too much stimulation in their nervous system. And so the way they cope with stress is to try and tamp down that activation because they don't have enough serotonin to do it pharmaceutically. And conversely, on the dopamine side, if you have too little dopamine, the way you calm down is, in essence, by calming up. You want to ramp up the amount of stimulation. You feel more normal. You feel more comfortable when you have a little bit more stimulation. So they manage stress and sometimes mismanage it by looking for ways to ramp it up. That's why they're more risk tolerant. They take more chances because when you're taking a chance, you're experiencing some amount of potential danger, threat, uncertainty, and it increases the amount of arousal. So all these things really relate to the amount of arousal in the system at any given time. Yes. Yeah, so and for someone who's gone through trauma, I know a lot of people who've experienced PTSD, instead of dealing with it, tend to internalize a lot of the impacts from it. What causes that to happen 
versus the inclination to want to seek help and mitigate the circumstance? So PTSD, it affects both sides, both groups. So PTSD happens when we experience a very traumatic event. There's a certain branding at that moment into our memory centers of that event. So it sticks with us. You can remember where you were with 9-11. You can come right back to when you found out that the towers were assaulted. For some of us, we can remember where we were when Kennedy was assassinated. These big events, and it's going to be on a lower level as far as a more personal level of things that happen in your life that are traumatic, either in your childhood, whatever those events are. So they're locked in. So when you are reminded of that event, if you are shy on the stimulating transmitters, the dopamine people, again, their behaviors accentuate. Those behaviors that we see where there are impulse issues, there are all the activating behaviors that we see in that group become more exaggerated. And on the other side of the equation, for serotonin people that have experienced a PTSD event, when they are reactivated, again, as Colin pointed out, this becomes too much arousal into their nervous system, so they retreat even further. So it actually exaggerates both behaviors on either side when PTSD is reactivated. Yeah, that's really fascinating how it has an adverse effect on both groups, but in different ways. I wanted to bring it up because it's, it is a topic that we've covered a lot on the show. I think it's an important distinction for people to understand. Well, Connell, you guys open up the book by asking a fundamental question that I think all the listeners probably have thought at one time or another, and that is, why do we keep things that we know don't serve our best interest instead of doing the things that are helpful and constructive? And so I was hoping you might touch on that through the science that you uncover in the book. We're pretty bound by wanting to be comfortable. The emotional comfort that I'm talking about, where you feel safe, normal, at peace, is I think an intuitive barometer for what we experience as homeostasis or balance in the system. And it's good so that if you're cold, you put a jacket on or you turn the heater on. We use comfort as a, a tool to make adjustments around, but comfort can also be work against us. It can be very self-defeating because some of the things that we need to do that are healthy for us make us uncomfortable. You have a serotonin imbalance. For example, you may be more, much more prone to social anxiety. Going out and having social interactions, which would be healthy for you to do, and would ultimately be generative and constructive in your life, you might avoid. And the avoidance then serves the, that barometer of comfort, because when you avoid something, that you get a little bit of a reward hit, a release and arousal, when you've avoided something you anticipate making you uncomfortable. So comfort is really the kind of the internally organizing principle that we all use. And sometimes we use it in a way that's healthy for us. And sometimes we use it in a way that really hurts us. Well, there has been so much talk about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and choosing the growth option instead. It's interesting that this is really rooted in the brain type that we have. So I found that to be really fascinating in the way that you describe it. One of the sections of the book that really caught my eye was you all write that repetitive negative thinking is linked to cognitive decline. And that's something I never really understood before reading it. Can you tell the audience a little bit more why that's the case? Negative thinking for the serotonin group is their comfort zone. Negative thinking for the dopamine group is 
it doesn't register. They're looking for stimulation. They're looking for new information. They don't assess problems in the same way. They're more optimistic. The more you engage that behavior, and in this case, the negative thinking, we're looking at a particular trait of the shields, the serotonin group, they're not evolving. They're not challenging themselves. They're not going into a social situation that might in fact pay off into a new friendship or pay off into something that would actually be good for them. The less you challenge yourself in that regard, the less you're going to evolve. If you look at data on dementia, as an example, one of the therapies that we have available to us to inhibit the dementia creeping in is to stay intellectually challenged and to keep ourselves motivated to learn new things to negative thinking is the opposite of that this is some this is becomes important for you to keep your brain cells moving and if you just retreat into these comfort areas your cognitive abilities are going to suffer yeah, it is interesting, though, because there is a rise of both dementia and Alzheimer's that is occurring. Do you think modern society and the foods we're eating and the microbiome are playing into that? Do you think it's we're not getting enough sleep and the amyloid plaque is building up and it can't be released? What do you think are some of the causes for the rise? Because it's not just in the United States. It seems to be a global phenomenon. If you look at pollutants, everything re doesn't relate to brain chemistry imbalances, obviously. And there are a lot of things that affect cognitive abilities over time and the process of aging. I was reading something just in the last few days about the image was that we tend to ingest in one way or another, breathing it in or eating it, a credit card worth of microplastics every day. I don't know how they came up with that, but that was the image, was a credit card worth of microplastics. There are microplastics in the Antarctic. It is everywhere. It's in the water we drink. It's in, in the air that we breathe. Plastics that have taken over our lives. So if you look at just at, at pollution, our environment is changing. And I'm looking at those things that, that, that are obviously global. Those are not just something that is going on in our country. I think stress and the rapidity of change, we've never experienced change at quite the rate that we are experiencing, I think, globally. The adaptation to change has always been at a slower pace. It is just accelerating. So stress is another element. But getting back to what David was saying about negative thinking, I think that the reason that that is such an important notion is that it's one of those things that you can attack because negative thinking is, it constrains behavior. It underlines those things that you tell yourself that rule out certain kinds of things as opposed to ruling, ruling them in. It, it tends to amplify and in those amplifications, it restricts more and more, you know, what you'll do. And the more you restrict what you do, the less degrees of freedom that you have and the less that you really use your brain in a functional way that keeps it most alive and vibrant. John, you brought up two very interesting points. You brought up the microbiome. We've learned that there is a definite gut-brain relationship. We inherit our microbiome. And what the microbiome is, it's a collection of bacteria, viruses, funguses, toxins that sit in this little structure called the cecum. The cecum is the connection between the small intestine and the colon. It's where the appendix sits. And in that very small area, we have this balancing act of all these different things. That balancing act that we do inherit controls our immune system. It controls the concentration of dopamine and serotonin and other neurotransmitters. It regulates our blood sugar. It does a lot of different things. It has a direct relationship with the brain and how our emotional system plays out. 
So the microbiome, which we're really starting to understand now is crucial to understanding the brain. Using sleep as an example, getting back to the swords and the shields and how this plays out and relates to dementia. Both sides have sleep issues. So someone that is a shield and shy in serotonin neurotransmitters, they have a sleep disturbance because they don't fall asleep easily. They lay there and ruminate about all the problems that they had, not only during the day, but what's going to happen the next day or a month from now. So they have a sleep problem from that point of view. The swords, on the other hand, they have a sleep disturbance, but theirs is different. Theirs is based on wanting constant stimulation. So they, they don't go to sleep. They stay up as long as they can. So the brain requires at least two hours a night of restorative sleep. We need seven hours about in total. Two hours of that has to be restorative. And what happens during restorative sleep is that the ventricles in the brain, which are like the kidneys for the rest of the body, they clean up the toxins. And if you're denied those two hours of restorative sleep, the ventricles aren't going to get to do their work. And these other products, like you mentioned, the amyloid, the tau proteins, they build up, they don't get excreted, and they start plugging up some of these glial cells or these neurons that we think are directly related to memory and to cognition. A sleep disorder, and we get into this in the book, a sleep disorder has direct reference to both groups, and the microbiome has an overall relationship to how our basic chemistry is formed. The microbiome determines whether we're a sword or a shield. Yeah, it's interesting. I interviewed Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her or not, but she lives in Connecticut. She wrote a book that came out this year called Younger You, and she was the first person to run a clinical trial where she was able to show against a control group that through diet, sleep, reducing toxins, she could reduce biological age. And it's interesting to me, if I am not getting adequate sleep, how much in a very quick time, my cognitive functioning and other aspects start to decline. I find the same thing depending on what I'm eating as well. If I'm eating a very clean diet, I have much greater ability to focus. I feel much more energized. I feel just tremendously better and I typically sleep better. And I find when I start allowing a more junk diet in, it has an almost overnight impact that you can feel once you start experimenting with it. It's interesting because it, through her research, she found that 40% of premature deaths could be prevented by the choices that we make, which are leading to things of so many unhealthy lifestyles that we have right now. And it seems through your research that the brain type and how you approach those life decisions directly has a huge impact on how you're going to live, how you're going to feel, how you're going to perform. And those relate directly to your brain type, to whether you are shy in either serotonin or dopamine. And when you don't sleep, you're producing more cortisol to keep you alert and more cortisol is going to ultimately lead to some agitation and some poor eating behavior if you're very tired you didn't sleep well you're going to eat any kind of cracker or chip or anything that's not good for you to keep your blood sugar up and so i think she's exactly right well i think that has given the audience a really good foundation for the brain types. What I wanted to do now in the interview was to go into how does your brain type influence different aspects of your life? So the first one that you all cover is how the brain chemistry influences our most fundamental approaches to work and career. And Connell, I was hoping you might be able to take that one. The way it relates to work and career is very much based on which side you're imbalanced. If you look at how we manage other people, whatever relationships we have, we deal with managing emotions, managing expectations, 
there are certain kinds of tendencies that shields have, those who are deficient in serotonin, that manifest in their work. And conversely, on the sword side, there are certain kinds of aspects there that get manifested in terms of work. And what we've tried to do is to explain how some of those things come up and can be compensated for. And if you're on the dopamine side, the anger, for example, is one thing that everybody needs to manage. Some people in, if you're managing down, you're a boss and you are supervising a number of people, it's very easy to misuse those kinds of relationships in terms of anger management. Anger is one issue that people with dopamine balances can have. When they get aroused, they tend to be more expressive, so they discharge it. Whereas serotonin imbalanced people, when they get overly stimulated, they tend to feel more anxious. They internalize that kind of anger. So if you're in a position of supervising people and things aren't going well, you've got to learn how to manage your anger and modulate that. The ways that it, that it affects work are in terms of things like self-confidence. If you have social anxiety, it makes it very difficult to come into a group and make a presentation that you might be expected to make. Issues around brain chemistry play out in countless ways in terms of how we approach our everyday work. Yeah, and part of what I read in the book is you said that shields typically underreach, which can create obstacles to success, and they need to change their risk profile to accommodate for that. And on the other hand, swords have obstacles when it comes to ambition and success. So one of the things I think, Connell, you brought up earlier was that we have more stress hitting us now than we ever have before. And I think if you look at what automation, AI, robotics, everything else is throwing at the workforce today, the workforce of tomorrow is going to completely change. Hundreds of millions of jobs are going to change. So I think one of the fundamental things, if someone's listening to this, is how do our brain types impact the way we're going to be to a, able to adapt to the shifting workplace environment? That's really an interesting question, because if you look at the requirements for being competitive today are very different than they were even a decade ago. And I think that this change is going to continue to accelerate. And you brought up something that I think is certainly affects people who are serotonin imbalanced. They do tend to underreach. They underreach because underreaching is more comfortable not because that's the limit of their capacity, but it's the limit of sometimes of their comfort. So it's comfortable to underreach. But I think if you look at the changes that are going to be demanded of all of us tomorrow in the, these years moving forward, we're going to have to really deal with being uncomfortable. We're going to have to deal with kind of stretching our capacities to deal with with comfort because we're going to have to learn new techniques to stay up with the evolution of, of where AI and robotics are going. There are going to be a lot of jobs that are lost. Our capacity for intelligence uh, is, as human beings, is pretty much set so that we're going to have to really push ourselves, I think, to stay up with the changes to remain competitive. Either that or is there going to have to be some kind of economic model that changes. If work becomes something that done by robots and not by human beings, then there's got to be some new economic model that we're going to have to invent. It's also going to totally change the way we look at our own career choices. I'll use medicine as a perfect example. In medical school, a hundred years ago, we were taught algorithms to solve problems. We didn't have the use of certain imaging techniques and blood tests. And so we thought more, we examined more carefully, 
now those algorithms through AI have been reworked and you can take a picture of a skin lesion, send it to your doctor. You'll not only know what that is, but they'll also recommend the treatments. And this is going to become true in all aspects of medicine. And doctors that are used to spending time asking questions and getting to know you personally and establishing a trusting doctor-patient relationship, that's going to change. We're not going to see eight people a day. We're going to be required to see 30 people a day. The other day I got out of an elevator at the hospital and there was a robot that was moving around and it was functional for the hospital. It brought supplies to the nurses. It actually could wave its arm as if it was almost human and have big eyes that made it look like it was human. But we're going to have to adjust, as Khan said, to all these different nuances that are being redefined. It's going to be a different world. And if you're a shield or a sword with that amount of stimulation and the comfort that we had that's now going to be less comfortable, all of these things are going to require us to know who we are to better adapt. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And I also found it was interesting, given we talked about the microbiome earlier, that you all found a correlation between the microbiome and social connections, which I found was pretty intriguing. What was that connection? One of the connections with the microbiome is the more diverse the microbiome is, diversity in terms of the biome is connected to diversity in terms of behavior. And so if you eat a restricted diet, you tend to have less diversity in the microbiome. So if you take a kid who is a finicky eater, there are only a certain few foods that that kid will eat. That microbiome that will be affected by the diet that that child eats is going to have an impact on the range of behaviors that child will feel comfortable engaging in. So even just our food groups, by expanding food groups, you expand that microbiome. And in that expansion, you give yourself degrees of freedom and behavior that you don't even think about that just happen as a result of that kind of diversity. And to validate the microbiome in this, which as we mentioned earlier, is what actually determines the level of serotonin and dopamine in our systems. So that's a very important part of who we are. They've managed to take the microbiome from someone that was thin and transplant that into someone that was overweight. And that person that was overweight lost weight. And this is one of several examples of how we're going to be using the microbiome to treat health problems. And this is a little bit in the future, but these studies have already been validated. So that work is underway. I think one of the most fascinating things that I've seen in healthcare, and in some ways it I think is going to be an amazing positive, and in some ways I can see it being a negative, is the way that technology and medicine are coming together, especially when it comes into automation and genetics. And I see both sides of this. The great things that are going to happen and the unintended consequences that people who are inventing these new technologies haven't even thought through, similar to things that have happened already in the digital world. Well, I believe one of the biggest things that impacts relationships is we sometimes get into competing with our partner. And these brain types definitely would interfere with that competition if you're not understanding the needs of the other person or how you're counterbalancing each other. So I really appreciate you taking us deeper on that. The last area I wanted to talk about because I thought it was an interesting one is why does a calm child grow into a healthier and more successful adult? And I'm assuming calm here is someone who has not been raised in a stressful situation, maybe someone who hasn't experienced abuse or other aspects, but I was hoping you could first qualify that 
and then expand upon it. If you're calm, you have more access to who you are. The unique expression of social abilities, cognitive abilities, your emotional range, the, all those degrees of freedom are increased. But calm is related to arousal or activation in the central nervous system. So that if you have a child who is imbalanced on the serotonin side, naturally they experience a little bit more activation than is comfortable. So to calm them down, you really work with them, you give them skill sets that are common. They can be mindfulness exercises for kids, but you teach them how to deal with their relationship with themselves, how to self-soothe. So those kinds of skills have the tendency to calm them down. But if you're imbalanced on the dopamine side, the issue is very different. Calming is really learning how to increase the amount of arousal in the system because kids who are dopamine deficient tend to feel calmer when they have a little bit more stimulation. That's why so many kids get diagnosed, particularly little boys, if they're imbalanced on the dopamine side, can get diagnosed as ADHD. And very often, their medication is prescribed. Well, you'd think, and these medications are stimulant medications, whether it's Ritalin or Adderall, or, but they're on the arousal side. They stimulate the nervous system. And you think if you give someone who's distractible and has attention problems, a little bit hyperactive, can't sit without squirming around, a stimulant, you'd think that would just put them off the chart. But what it does is calms them down because their behavior is what's compensating for the lack of natural stimulation in their nervous system. So when you amplify that pharmaceutically with a medication, you bring it up nat naturally, they can drop all of the compensatory behavior. They become more focused. So kids need to be calmed up and calmed down because when they're calm, when they're feeling at ease, they have most access to their uniqueness and their abilities and they then express those in, in the most constructive ways that they are capable of doing. And that pharmacology that Hans speaking of applies to both sides. So that if you are serotonin deficient, and that's creating a tremendous amount of worry and rumination and obsessive behaviors, if you give them a medication like the SSRIs that are serotonin producing, those behaviors are mitigated and they become less anxious. They worry less, they ruminate less. So there is a pharmacologic approach to treating these two different sides. However, that's only a part of it because the behavioral relationship that we develop throughout our lives has to also be addressed. Those are the harder ones. It's easy to give somebody a pill, an ADHD kid, a pill that's a stimulant to calm them down. It's much harder to treat people once they become young adults or older adults that have developed these habits over their life that compensate to make these changes. This plays out in the health issues and why people, it's hard to get people to lose weight, to stop smoking, to sleep better. So this is where the behavioral aspect and the strategies that we offer in the book become very important. Okay, and I always like to close on this question with authors, and I'll let you each take a turn answering it. If there was one thing that you wanted a reader to take away from your book, what would it be? I think from my point of view, what I would want a reader to take away from the book was a feeling of not only understanding themselves in a much deeper way than they have before, by being able to identify some of the things that are related to their brain chemistry, but that they would feel like they had more degrees of freedom 
going forward. They could do things in a little bit different way that would make them more in control of their lives. I think that the intent of what we try to give our patients and what we put in into the book are ways to really increase your degrees of freedom, to give you a greater sense of control over the things in your life that would be helpful and that would be constructive to your relationships, that would allow you to eat in a more consistently healthful way, exercise more consistently, but to bring vitality and health and clarity into your life. My response to that, John, would be that I would like the reader to come away with the understanding that they actually will have more control in their life to becoming more comfortable and to understanding those behaviors that have consistently gotten them into some hot water on some level. And that there's finally a mechanism by understanding their brain chemistry and applying very strategic exercises to change those, that we're no longer restricted to generic advice for changing our behavior. Our book is very personalized. I think that it's a very interesting way to look at why you do the things you do and to give you the tools to do them better. Okay. And if a listener wanted to learn more about you and the book, what is the best place for them to go? There's a, a website they can go to, overridebooks.com. That's probably the best place for them to go. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and discussing this great book. And congratulations again on its release and this many decades year of partnership that you both have. I really appreciate you coming on today. John, thank you very much for having us. It's been a pleasure. It has been. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Dr. Connell Cowan and Dr. David Kipper, and I wanted to thank them and Penguin Random House for the privilege and honor of having them here on the show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with my friend, Hillary Billings, who's a popular viral video creator and strategist with over a billion views. She is the co-founder and CEO of Attentioneers, where she leads a creative agency that helps entrepreneurs and brands drive reach and revenue through short form video strategies. Hillary is also also an expert on the psychology of attention. Diluted focus equals diluted results. So what we want to do is be very intentional and hyper-focused on the messaging, on the intent, on the, the way that we are going to go about getting the results that we want for people to just hyper-focus that reputation to be able to break through. Otherwise, it's like throwing spaghetti at a wall and someone's hoping that at some point that it'll stick. The fee for this show is that you share it with family and friends when you find something useful or interesting. If you know someone who is interested in the science that Dr. David Kipper and Dr. Penel Cowan discussed today, then definitely share this episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, go out and become passion struck.